Hello, loyal listeners. Welcome back to the Anxiety Book Club. This is episode 19. And I'm very pleased to be joined today with Shauna Shapiro, PhD. Uh, She is a best-selling author, clinical psychologist, and internationally recognized expert in mindfulness and self-compassion. She is a professor at Santa Clara University and has published over 150 papers and three critically acclaimed books, one of which we'll be talking about today, whose title is Good Morning, I Love You, which, you know, this late into the Anxiety Book Club podcast, I don't mind, you know, having this open, you know, in a library or maybe on the subway, but I think maybe a year or two ago, I would have felt a little bit sheepish with a title like that. Um, I think that's a really, really great way to start. I'm laughing actually, because when I first suggested this title, um, my publisher said, you know, you're a scientist and, and are you sure you want to go with this? And I said, yes, it's really important. It's actually one of the most powerful practices I learned is this practice. Good morning. I love you, which I tell the story in my book. So then when it was getting translated um, and republished in the British edition, um, they said, can we retitle it, Rewire Your Mind? And I said, "Um, of course. Uh, Apparently, Good Morning, I Love You doesn't translate into British. (laughs) (laughs) That's too bad for them because it is a a really powerful practice. And I I think at the end of the interview, I definitely want to go over that because, yeah, I mean, I I felt its power as I read it. So I kind of want to start just with your story, because you have a compelling um, way of getting into mindfulness. And I'm sure you've told this story a million times and you start the book with it. But would you mind uh, giving us the short version again? Absolutely. So um, I discovered mindfulness when I was in my teens. I was going through one of the hardest times in my life. I had been diagnosed with scoliosis and had to have emergency surgery because my spine was... um, going so rapidly towards my lungs and they were worried it was going to puncture my lungs. And so I had been a healthy, active teenager. I was 17 years old. I was captain of my volleyball team and had just signed to play at Duke University in North Carolina. And all of a sudden, within a few weeks, I was lying in a hospital bed, unable to walk. Um, I had spinal fusion surgery. And during the many months of rehabilitation, You know, I experienced a lot of physical pain, but also a lot of emotional pain and fear and loneliness. And I just didn't have the tools to cope. And at that time, I was introduced to mindfulness and meditation. And it really transformed the way I saw life, the way I experienced my pain, and really my capacity to live. And so, after reading and learning as much as I could in the United States about it, once I was recovered a couple years later, I went to Thailand and Nepal and went to some monasteries there and studied for a few months um, really to go deep into mindfulness. And my experiences there were so profound, not that they were easy, but profound that when I came back to the US, I decided to get my PhD and study the science of mindfulness so that I could help others and and just learn more myself. So that's really what brought me here. And it's been 20 some years. And what's been extraordinary is really the science that, you know, these, these kind of seeming miracles that I experienced while I was in Thailand and Nepal are now backed by science. We know that mindfulness improves your immune functioning and it decreases stress and cortisol and it reduces pain and it helps you sleep better. We also know that it makes you happier and feel less lonely and more connected and that it can literally rewire your brain. And so I think that's really the topic of my book is the science and the practice. How how do we change and transform our lives? Totally. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. And Glad that you found some really useful tools uh, after going through something that sounds very, very difficult. So I I guess, you know, living in the United States and, you know, having a good family and friends is sometimes not enough. Like these coping skills 
aren't sort of passed down through our genes. There may be sometimes things that we have to learn on our own or, or I guess through some teachers. Absolutely. And I would say we learn everything, even, even with our genes and even with our genetics, but the whole field of epigenetics is that certain genes are expressed and certain aren't depending on our environment and the practices we're engaging in. And so I'm a firm believer that no matter what's happened to you in your life, no matter what your genetics, no matter what your current situation, that it's never too late, that it's never too late to change. It's never too late to learn, to grow, and that there are practices that are science-based that can literally help us re-architect the very structure of our brain and live healthier, happier lives. And so my book was really intended to offer these practices of mindfulness and self-compassion and gratitude that anyone can practice and that what you practice grows stronger, right? That's the central tenet of neuroplasticity. Whatever you practice grows stronger so we can orient and incline our mind in a certain direction. So uh, the your specific story, which involves physical pain, um, is an interesting one. I was at lunch the other day with a friend of mine and we were talking about mindfulness and he said, well, you know, what if you have chronic pain? Like how, how can mindfulness help with that? And I recalled, you know, reading some John Kabat-Zinn at some point about his mindfulness-based stress reduction trials on people with chronic pain. And I know, I know for me personally, mindfulness is a lot or, or formal mindfulness of sitting on the cushion is a lot easier to do when I'm not tired and I'm not sick. Um, in which case I mostly just want to watch TV. Is there a difference and, and maybe what is the difference uh, between like trying to bring mindfulness to difficult things, maybe emotionally slash, you know, difficult things that are actual pain, you know, whatever is happening in our nervous system. Is there, is there like a different approach? Well, a, a couple of things you said that I think are really important. First, you know, mindfulness was actually brought to Western medicine specifically to work with patients who had chronic and severe pain. So um, it was taught to people who were pretty much always in pain. And what the research shows is that it was incredibly effective. Not that it was easy, but even at four year follow-ups, the patients were still finding relief. And it wasn't that it always took away or decreased the pain. For some people it did, but for some people what it showed is their relationship to the pain changed and they were able to engage in their daily lives, which before had been severely limited. So I think the goal of mindfulness is not to only practice when we feel healthy and happy, although you're right, it's certainly often easier then. Um, but the goal of mindfulness is to learn how to be present and how to meet life, whatever and however it's showing up with kindness and with grace. And I think the kindness piece is often left out of mindfulness. So if I'm in pain and I'm trying to practice mindfulness and I'm trying to focus my attention, but my attention keeps getting distracted and I'm in so much pain, I'm getting frustrated. In that moment, you bring kindness to yourself. Sweetheart, this is hard. You're in a lot of pain. You take a breath. You stay present in this curious, kind way. And I think a lot of times people think of mindfulness as just paying attention it's really so much more. It's really about how you pay attention, the quality, this welcoming, open, kind attitude, even when things are hard. Yeah, I, I, that's a great segue because I, I wanted to get to that. I, I've been practicing mindfulness for a few years now, but it, it feels like only now and I'm, am I fully awakening to this idea of, you know, the quality of the attention, um, you know, it being sort of kind and open and generous and it almost feels like that part of, you know, mindfulness is maybe like the ugly stepchild or something. I, I guess I wonder why, why it's maybe gotten lost um, through like mainstream introductions to mindfulness. And I think my second question is, can, if you just pay attention, like you just devote yourself to vanilla mindfulness, like regular old paying attention to your anchors, the breath and the other things, is something like compassion will it naturally develop sort of by osmosis or do you, do you need to add things to your practice? Um, like some of the teachings that are in the book. That's a great question. I believe that we need to explicitly practice 
And I'm not sure that's true for every person and every culture, but in the West, in my experience of, of working with probably tens of thousands of people at this point, we tend to be very self-critical and very judgmental. So if you leave someone alone and just tell them to pay attention, what tends to happen is they start to judge themselves. They start to think of all their flaws. They criticize themselves. They shame themselves. And what you actually end up practicing is not attention, but self-judgment. So I think it's important to explicitly teach people this attitude of kindness and then to practice it again and again. Because I can't tell you how many times I've told a patient or a client or a student, pay attention with kindness. And they come back to me and they're like, oh, I was judging myself. I was so frustrated. I'm terrible at this. I'm like, what happened to the kindness? And they're like, oh, right. It's like people think it's just a side note or something nice to have, but not essential. It's actually essential. And when you look, you know, at the Buddha Sutras and you look at, you know, the focused attention, right? I do believe that sustained focus attention can lead to good feelings and that penetrating insights into the nature of reality, into the nature and understanding that we're all completely connected and interdependent can lead to greater compassion for others and for oneself and for our world. However, I think it is more effective to teach it to teach people how to be kind and to have different practices. So there are some practices that focus just on attention and there's some fa- practices that focus just on kindness or on compassion, right? Kindness meets the present moment, but it turns into compassion when the present moment is filled mm-hmm. with pain, right? And those are different. And so there's different flavors and qualities. And I would say the simplest way to understand it is that mindfulness is your lens. Mindfulness helps you see things clearly in the present moment because you're paying attention. And then depending on what you're meeting, it changes. So if you're meeting joy, all of a sudden you might start practicing mudita, which is empathic joy. And you, you know, you see your son score a soccer goal and you're like, yes. And you feel, take joy in his joy. You might send loving kindness to, to a friend who you're just thinking of and you're appreciating Or you might see your elderly parent in pain and you might turn to compassion. What mindfulness does is it's kind of like the, the, as I said, the lens that helps you discern how to meet the present moment. So the word mindfulness means to see clearly. So all we're doing is trying to see clearly what's happening so we can respond effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And I want to get to some of those self-compassion practice. But I have a question for you, sort of on the note of, of paying attention and self-judgment. So I've started hosting just with a few of my really close friends on Tuesday nights, like a little sangha, where we'll meditate together for just 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll kind of reflect or, you know, uh, shoot the shit. I think I can say shit. This is my podcast. So I guess that's fine. But I'll know I noticed that a lot of times when I go around the table and I ask everyone, how it went for them, how the 10 minutes sit went for them. A lot of times I hear, well, uh, I did a good job, you know, like I, I was in the moment or I did a terrible job. I was distracted the whole time. And I want to, I want to like remind them that like, number one, you probably aren't necessarily in control of whether or not, you know, your mind wandered or necessarily of, of when it came back, which is just a hypothesis I have. But secondly, it's not a, it's not, it's not a competition, right? It's not like a, who can stay in the moment the longest. And I, I don't know exactly how to like let these novice meditators know that, um, you know, me not being trained as a, a meditation teacher at all. Do, do you have any thoughts on that or advice? Yes, I, I think that's a great question and one that's so often overlooked. So people, you know, m- mistake mindfulness, as I've said before, for just like this focused attention. And it's like, The more your mind wanders off, the worse you're doing. And so often people think they're terrible at it. But what research shows is the average person's mind wanders 47% of the time. So about half of your life, you're not going to be present. You're not going to be here. And so really the practice of, of meditation is how do you bring yourself back, right? Do you beat yourself up? Do you say, darn it, Shauna, you know, why can't you do this? I'm terrible at this. Or do you notice the mind has wandered, gently bring yourself back and For me, I tend to re-relax my body. It's like I begin again because that's the beauty of this practice is 
you can begin again in any moment, right? It's never too late. You haven't messed up your meditation. You haven't messed up your life. You can always begin again. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And not to go too deep down the, you know, self or not self rabbit hole thing, but you know, when we're encouraged to observe ourselves non-judgmentally, do you think it is the case that we, <laughs> in some sense, control whether or not we're distracted or control whether or not we awaken and come back? Because I was thinking if 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 we're not in control of that, then there's no room for judgment, right? Like Exactly. Exactly. Did you choose to start thinking about your grocery list or, you know, the trip to Hawaii or what your boss said? No, of course not. Your mind has no shame. It goes wherever it wants to go. It's like this monkey, right? It's swinging from thought to thought. And so your only job is in the moment that you wake up to bring yourself back with kindness and with presence. And I would say also, so that's your attitude. And I would also say your only other job is to set your intention mm. when you begin. My intention is to be present. I dedicate my heart, my time, my body to this practice. May it be of benefit. And then you do your best. And some days it'll be really peaceful and calm and still. And, and other days it won't. But just like you said, why would you get mad at yourself? Do you get mad at yourself? It's like the mind, the brain spews out thoughts just like the salivary glands spew out saliva. Do you get mad every time your mouth starts watering? Are you like, stop it, stop it. Why are you doing that? <laughs> I haven't done that personally, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm glad that's a really good perspective. I'm glad, um, you know, it resonates with what I was thinking. So something you just said, you know, um, about intention, it, it's reflected in the book, right? You have this list of three things, which I guess lists are pretty common in the, you know, mindfulness or Buddhist tradition, but Attention is num number two in the book is the one that everyone focuses on. Number three is what we've mostly been talking about, which is attitude. And the first thing which you declared intention, um, I think it also doesn't get mentioned a lot. I know for myself doing like maybe some forgiveness practices or loving kindness practices, the intention is useful, especially if you can't get all the way there of, you know, loving your enemy, but you can intend towards it. So how important, it must be important, you put it at number one, but how important is this? <laughs> intention part in the whole, you know, sitting mindfulness thing. So the model I created of mindfulness has three elements, intention, attention, attitude, and your intention really sets the stage for what is possible, right? It's, it's your compass. It's what guides you in the direction you want to head. So your intention, it's not a destination. It's an orientation or an aspiration. And so really it's about What's most important to me? What do I care about? In what direction do I want to set the compass of my heart? And so we set our intention and that guides the rest of the practice. So intention is actually incredibly valuable and important. And the research bears this out. People who set an intention to be happy without doing any other practice, 30 days later are happier. So our intentions, you know, they, they kind of become our, our map. And so, you know, if you're using the wrong map, you're not going to get where you want to go. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll tell you just a short story about intention is when my son was younger, I was away teaching in Europe um, for two weeks and he was about nine years old, but it was the longest we'd been apart and it was really hard. And on the way home, I started getting really anxious. Like I've been away too long. I, I made a bad choice as a mom. Um, and I started kind of spiraling down anxiety and guilt and shame. And instead of doing that, I set a clear intention. And I remember this vividly. I was in the middle seat of a coach, you know, flight from Copenhagen back to California. And I said, when I get home, I'm not going to unpack, check mail, check email. I'm going to spend those first 24 hours with my son reconnecting. So that was my intention. That was my aspiration. So I get home. And we live in California. It was a beautiful day and we both loved the beach. So I said, hey, Jackson, why don't we go to the beach today? And he says, sure. So I start packing up his favorite stuff and his favorite foods for the perfect picnic for the perfect day. And I'm all ready to go. And I say, hey, Jackson, let's go. And he's like, nah, I don't feel like it. And I'm like, what? We're going to go to the beach and I'm going to show you how much I love you. Damn it. <laughs> and so he kind of begrudgingly gets on his swim trunks and he comes out the door and 
um, I'm at the car and I'm ready to go and I'm kind of in agenda mode. You know, I want to get there in time for the perfect sunlight, the perfect picnic. And I call to him. I say, let's go. And he doesn't even look up at me. He just sits down on our front porch and I start getting impatient and frustrated. And I'm about to kind of snap at him when all of a sudden I remember my intention. What's the most important thing? Oh yeah. I don't care if we go to the beach. All I want to do is reconnect with my son. And so it guided me instead of, you know, snapping at him to walk back over to him. And I sat down next to him on the front porch and he was watching these ants and we're sitting there and they're actually kind of interesting. So I'm sitting there watching the ants and after a minute or two, I feel his body begin to soften. And then he leans his little shoulder into my shoulder. I feel the sun on our backs. And that was it. That was the most important thing. But we forget. And so our intention is what reminds us what really matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a nice story. I hope he continues to not be embarrassed about that as he gets older. <laughs> yes, he's now 16 and he's like, oh my God, stop talking about that. <laughs> so, so, okay, so just to press on it one once more. So I guess what I'm hearing is that because mindfulness is presented as sort of a, a way of living in the book and not necessarily like a, I mean, not necessarily um, limited only to like formal practice. Intention is not necessarily something I, I need to do when I sit down on the cushion in the morning, but it is something that I, I should encourage myself to set just kind of uh, generally speaking. Yes. Beautiful. A really important question. So people often ask me, you know, what's the difference between mindfulness and meditation? So mindfulness, as you said, is a way of being. Meditation is the practice that we engage in to strengthen that. But we can strengthen it all day long through practicing these three principles of intention, attention, and attitude. So for example, before our podcast, I spent a minute or two just reflecting on what is my intention, right? May this be of benefit. May I stay open, curious, kind. And it just helps guide you. And I think so often in our lives, we're just going on automatic pilot. We, we forget, right? We meet a friend for lunch and we just start talking about our day or what's happened or what's stressful. And we forget the most important thing. Oh, I want to connect with them. Or I pick my son up at school, but I've just been on a conference call and I'm thinking about a book chapter I'm writing and I'm not fully present. But if I pause before I pick him up and I set the intention I want to be present with Jackson now. It helps guide me. So we can practice throughout our day. And in fact, I work with a lot of corporations right now. And this is what we do is we work with this three-part model. When we're doing a board meeting, when we have a big presentation, when there's an important call is what is my intention? Can I be fully present, bring my attention with this attitude of kindness and curiosity? Yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. It's, you know, it's difficult in our sort of goal-oriented ways of being um, to not get lost on the way to the goal. I, I know I've had very self-aware and ironic moments racing on my bike to get home as fast as possible for an online meditation. <laughs> we have all had those. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. And so then in those moments, again, you're like, oh, sweetheart, that's ironic, you know, and there's no shame. There's no judgment. There's no like, oh, you're such a fake. You're not really a good meditator. You know, and, and that's a lesson that I've really had to learn is that this isn't about the goal and it's not about perfect. It's about practice, you know, and so I'll say, well, can I be 5% more patient or can I be 5% less stressed or can I be 5% more open to new ideas? And it's a process and a practice. Mm -hmm. So in the book, there's a section where you have myths about mindfulness or meditation and one of them that I know was a sticking point for me and is also, I think, a sticking point for others is the difference between acceptance and resignation. And I don't know if this is just a sort of an artifact of English or maybe in other languages, people don't see the word acceptance and they're like, OK, I have to accept that, you know, my apartment is too small and my you know feet are dirty, like. I, I guess what I'm trying to tease apart is like when, when people hear the word acceptance from the kind of conventional wisdom of mindfulness and stuff, they, they, sometimes they resign, right. And they say like, okay, my life stinks, but the Buddha or whatever told me that I just need to accept this. Like, 
can you is there anything to tease apart there and can you can you help us absolutely it's such an important one so first of all acceptance does not mean passive resignation it does not mean you just give up what acceptance means is you're acknowledging that's what's happening that you probably don't like right now but what's happening is already happening right it's it's already here and so what acceptance means is that we are willing to face it and see it clearly. And from that place of acceptance, we're able to respond wisely. And so people often, you know, mistake this to kind of say, oh, well, I just have to passively resign to whatever happened in life. Absolutely not. But what it means is we need to surrender to the way things are because they already are this way. And that's really the key is can I soften and meet the present moment so that I can see it clearly and then use all my resources to figure out the best response? And sometimes we can make a change. And I think in, in areas of social justice and areas of injustice, we need to make changes. Um, but often, you know, we approach situations with so much resistance and so much anger that we don't see them clearly. So you're you're a psychologist. I don't know if you're still seeing clients or mostly doing other things. I guess what I'm interested in is like, are you still using whatever you learned in school, like traditional Western psychological techniques, or is psychology these days sort of just being, you know, professional mindfulness? Like, how do you see the field, and and what tools do you use for yourself and maybe your clients if you're practicing? Um, and like, what, what is your, what are your thoughts about that? Yes, it's a great question. So I am a firm believer in science. I've been a researcher for 20 years and I think it's really important to continually evolve your practice, um, with the best science and also the teachings, um, of mindfulness that have informed my life so profoundly continue to be part of my practice, um, in therapy and they evolve too <laughs> that that as you continue to practice you gain new insights you you see things differently and so I, what i would say is that you know as a therapist i'm continually evolving and i'm drawing from every single source of information i possibly can okay well maybe another time we can get a little deeper into that um because i'm curious like what the limits of mindfulness are you know the boundaries i know it's useful, you know, for anxiety and depression, but, you know, can you use it for schizophrenia or all these other, you know, kinds of disorders? Right. So mindfulness is still relatively early as a science. Um, you know, there's about 40 some years of research. And so we do know that it's effective for many disorders. We, for example, it's not actually effective for depression. Um, as you just said, it's effective for um, preventing the relapse of major depressive disorder. So, there are other more effective therapies for treating major depression, but once you get better, what we've learned is that 78% of people relapse. That's not good. What they found is if you teach someone mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for depression, once they're better, it prevents them from relapsing, which is very, very important. So what we're learning in science is it's not a cure-all, but how can we use this to most benefit as many people as possible? So the last chapter, has, you know, it's kind of a cliffhanger. You're waiting all the way to the end to figure out what good morning I love you is. But I, I, I'm curious about that. I, I hope maybe you can share with the readers what that is. And and one other thing I'd like you to share about, I was, I'm always encouraging my mom to get into mindfulness. And I said, oh, I just read this book. And this, this lady says that you could just do one minute a day. And that's how you could get into it. So maybe you could talk about both of those things. Absolutely. So I think the most important thing is to begin. And we often have these like unrealistic expectations of ourselves. I'm going to run 10 miles a day. I'm going to meditate an hour a day. Um, and that doesn't really last. So the key is to set ridiculously unambitious goals. <laughs> and one minute a day feels pretty good. So I usually start people off with a minute meditation. And the most powerful practice that I've experienced in my life is um, the title of my book. And that's a practice that I learned while I was going through a pretty challenging divorce and was feeling a lot of self-judgment and shame. 
And my meditation teacher suggested I start a practice of saying, I love you every day when I woke up. And I was like, no way. <laughs> it just felt so contrived and inauthentic. And she noticed my hesitation and she suggested, well, how about just saying good morning, Shauna? And why don't you put your hand on your heart when you say it? Because that releases oxytocin. It's good for you. She knew the science would win me over. So the next morning I woke up, put my hand on my heart, and I said, good morning, Shauna. And it was kind of nice, right? Instead of the judgment and the fear and the anxiety, there was this flash of kindness. So I kept practicing. And after a few months, I um, put my hand on my heart, started my practice, good morning. And all of a sudden I had this image of my grandmother and I could feel her love for me. And then I could feel my mother's love. And before I knew it, I said, good morning. I love you, Shauna. And it was as if the dam around my heart burst and I could feel my own self-love. And I wish I could tell everyone listening that, you know, it's been this miracle of self-love ever since and I've never felt judgment or shame again. And that's not true. But what is true is this, this pathway of kindness, of compassion for myself was established. This idea that I could be on my own team, that I could be my own inner ally. And so I've continued to practice every day and it's growing stronger. And so what I would encourage people is to begin to try wherever you are, right? Rumi, oh, Hafiz it was. Hafiz says, wherever you are is the entry point. Just begin. That's really beautiful and encouraging. But I just want to give you an opportunity to highlight any more books you're writing or any more talks you're giving or any more projects you're working on or other things that listeners could get excited about? Well, first of all, I would love to hear from you. So I always respond to my emails. You can reach me at drshawnashapiro.com on my website or follow me on Instagram, Dr. Shauna Shapiro. And I post everything there. So please keep in touch there. I will have a good morning. I love you companion journal and workbook coming out. So look for that. And um, it was wonderful to speak with you, Joshua. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed chatting.